angular momentum of the uh, photons, and then we're going to uh, start to quantize some stuff. Okay, starting with um, the scalar field. Um, yeah, so in fact, we're going to do the scalar field, and then uh, for homework, we're going to uh, look at the photons and the uh, and the gravitons. Um, quantize it canonically and then hopefully in a week or two we're going to uh, take a brief look at class integrals. Uh, unfortunately we only have about a month and a half, very month, maybe slightly more than a month. So um, but certainly we I hope we'll get to at least some basic scattering processes. Okay, so um, let's continue with uh, the local current for and Maxwell. So remember what we are studying is you know the, the conserved current that came that comes from um, uh, looking at how Lagrangians transform under space-time transformations, and because the because the field theory is living in a flat space-time, uh, the only thing, the only dependence of the Lagrangian on space-time is through the uh, fields. Right? So that's the key point that I should emphasize. Um, maybe I should write it down just to make sure, but maybe I need my notes first. Um, yeah, so the key point is that Because uh, the fields reside in flat space-time, the Lagrangian depends on space-time solely through the fields. Okay. So if you're not familiar with uh, uh, GR or at least differential geometry, then you'll recognize that what is different when you go to a curved space is that now uh, the space-time, uh, the feet, the Lagrangian would now depend on space-time, but also through the metric, right? So, so that's the additional ingredient that makes uh, things more complicated. So you're no longer using AW nu, the flat metric, but uh, you're doing it also through, it also depends on um, some non-trivial metric G mu nu, right? Uh, so I, I should say, if you're, if you're a theorist these days, um, uh, it's, it's important to know some uh, differential geometry, right? So nowadays there's much more and more cross-disciplinary stuff going on. So it is important, I think, to at least have some understanding of uh, curve, curve space physics. But anyway, um, so what we're, gonna, what we're left with, so the last time we studied uh, translations, okay? And I won't repeat the argument, but uh, Under translations, we discovered that the local current uh, for space-time translation symmetry was actually just the uh, stress tensor of electromagnetism. Uh, strictly speaking, I guess I should say it's proportional to, right? So if you think 
if you think about this uh, carefully, you realize that it's hard to fix the overall coefficient of this guy. This is constant anyway, uh, sorry, it's conserved anyway. So you, you, if you take a divergence of this guy, um, you know, whether you multiply it by uh, 2,000 or uh, negative pi or whatever, you know, it's still conserved. So it's hard to fix the overall coefficient, but um, uh, in any case, uh, it is proportional to the stress energy of the stress energy tensor of uh, photons. And we even uh, step through an argument to show you, or at least to uh, motivate, uh, how to interpret um, uh, the individual components. Uh, so sometimes people tell you that, oh, you know, the, the, the components of a tensor are not uh, gauge invariant, uh, they're not coordinate invariant, and so you can't interpret them. Right? Some, sometimes you hear field theorists saying that. That's not quite true. Um, all you need to do is pick an orthonormal frame. In this case, it's just you're in flat space. So the components in a Cartesian basis uh, are, in fact, interpretable. And, and, and so one example of that is what we did the last time. And so 0, 0 is the energy density, 0, i, and i, 0 are the um, uh, uh, momentum density, uh, i, j is the shear, and then the i, i components are the, are the pressure. That's, that's the essence of it. Right. And so certainly you should be able to interpret them because they, they mean something. They, you use them to to interpret the content uh, of your fields, right? So this is in fact important to know how to interpret them. So now I'm going to show you that um, I can generalize this analysis to um, uh, Lorentz transformations. So, so Lorentz means that uh, I now take x alpha and then I replace it with x alpha uh, minus i omega. So this is some real uh, constant. Uh, can be rotation angle or the rapidity, doesn't, doesn't matter. And j hat, uh, I'm going to pick mu nu, alpha beta, x beta, right? So plus higher orders, right? So this is really uh, exponential. It's really an exponential, but maybe I should write it down just to just to um, remind you guys what I'm trying to do. Okay, and so um, uh, what we ought, we just we simply need only the infinitesimal but it's good to know where it comes from. So uh, what we're going to look at is uh, what we did a little bit with, uh, photon, uh, with scalars the last time. And so let me just write down the transformation laws. And um, uh, skip a few steps, right, so that I can, I can move a little bit quicker. But essentially, uh, remember that the Lagrangian here um, remember the Lagrangians for free Maxwell, I should say free Maxwell, is just one quarter F squared, sigma rho, sigma rho. And F mu nu itself is given by the curl of A. Okay? And <coughs> And the curl of A itself um, means that the Lagrangian itself only depends on the derivatives of the field, but not on the field itself. Okay. And uh, so the key point here is to recognize that this guy, uh, the derivative of the field, uh, transforms uh, as a two-index object. 
Okay, so what is this guy? This is actually you got to uh, contract this guy with Jacobians. This is a full transformation. Right, so what about Lorentz transformation? You are trying to apply lambda is this guy. But um, we only did the infinitesimal. So let me just write down what happens. So basically, you get partial mu a nu goes to partial mu a nu, and then uh, you have a um, uh, j for each index. So you get plus i omega j hat mu nu. Sigma, oops, uh, there I go again, right? I used mu nu, but uh, actually I want to use, um, okay, so I, let me see. Um, let's see which is easier to fix. Mu nu, mu nu, mu nu, okay. So I don't have a choice, I think uh, mu nu is easier to fix. So let me do it. Sigma rho, this is sigma rho, and then, so let's do, let us do now uh, alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta, this is now alpha sigma a beta plus i omega j you do sigma uh, data partial alpha a sigma and then so these are for transform this are the infinitesimal uh, uh, perturbations of the Jacobian contracted with the derivative and this is contracted with a and then there's another term that comes from Taylor expanding the derivative right so x that the a of x is going to become a of x uh, plus this infinitesimal shift. And so this guy is going to be contracted to uh, is going to be contracted into the derivative which then acts on the, uh, the first derivative. So this is a term that has second derivatives. Okay, so plus order omega squared. And um, so uh, for the Lagrangian itself, the Lagrangian, uh, because it's a scalar, it's just f squared, uh, it goes like, uh, the Taylor expansion minus i omega j hat mu nu uh, sigma rho x rho d sigma acting on f. Okay. And so um, basically, you discover that this is actually this whole thing because it's anti symmetric. So remember again that minus i j hat mu nu let's say sigma rho is nothing but Kronecker mu, Kronecker nu, sigma rho and disimmetrized. Okay? Uh, we choose the generator so that it's the basis matrix of the space of anti-symmetric matrices. And so as a result, um, uh, what's going on there is that um, this will just turn out to be basically L, and then this is from plus X nu partial mu acting on the Lagrangian. And so this is delta L from just say like standing the Lagrangian. Now you also have to plug in 
the variation. So, so this is one version of delta L. The other version of delta L is to, in fact, taper expand the Lagrangian in terms of the fields. But doesn't depend on the field, it depends only on the first derivative, right? So to alpha beta. So uh, you do this expansion, and then you've got to contract it with a variation of the uh, derivative. So this is where I made this complaint before the last time, that somehow uh, the books don't, don't recognize that when you, do, when you vary the derivative, uh, uh, it's not the derivative of the variation, right? So in fact, this guy here, this line over here is d alpha a beta plus delta d alpha a beta. Okay. And so, for example, um, <clears throat> you would you would end up you you will see that um, this this guy in particular is hard to see how this guy can become. Um, uh, uh, the derivative of a variation. Okay, and so what you'll find is that, in fact, what you need to do uh, is the following. So this I'll go a little bit faster because uh, we've done this before. This is actually just minus s alpha beta. Okay, the reason is that again you have two two uh, s. So when you differentiate them, you get minus one half, and then the derivative of one contracted with s. And then when you differentiate f with respect to this, you get another factor of 2, because the indices are anti-symmetric. Uh, so that's how you get it. And, and so you get basically this guy here. Now, this guy has three terms. One term here, one term here, and the final term over here. Okay? And what you, re what you would uh, uh, end up uh, seeing is that uh, uh, if you use the fact that f alpha beta is just nothing but this f alpha beta is nothing but d a d alpha a beta minus d beta a alpha, you use the explicit expression here and and contract it with these two guys, and you will find that actually is zero. Okay, so and the, so the only thing left is in fact the contraction of this term. With, uh, with, with this f alpha beta. So I'm just going to write that down. This is going to be minus f alpha beta. Okay, and then uh, let me just say uh, first two terms of delta uh, delta partial alpha a beta would vanish upon contraction. Okay, so if you don't believe me, try, try it out. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll explain a little bit why it's actually quite obvious that that's going to happen. Um, and so then we get minus i, minus, uh, actually let me just write it as, uh, uh, yeah, let me just write it as minus i omega, and then uh, J hat uh, mu nu sigma rho x rho partial sigma acting on, sorry, I'm going to write it on the next line, acting on what? Acting on partial alpha partial uh, A beta. Okay? That's basically this line here. Now, uh, again, uh, we've got to recognize, so this is where, again, if you read the books, they will, they will do this. There are some books who actually do this. Tesky and Schroeder doesn't even do this, I, I don't think. Um, there are books who does this, do, who do this, but they go on to, uh, you know, I don't know what they, uh, they, they go on to basically tell you some, um, some things that are just not uh, quite right. So in particular, they don't, Try to vary it in, in this in this way. I try to vary it, and but they do get an answer. They integrate by parts. They get an answer, and they tell you that oh look, it's not 
it's not uh, symmetric and it's not you know it's not the angular momentum and so on, right? So so already uh, we've encountered this problem the last time, um, but let me just show you uh, how I think it should be done so that you can simply get a clean answer in terms of uh, angular momentum. So again, you want to recognize just as the last time that this alpha beta is contracted with alpha beta, and this is anti-symmetric. So therefore, I am able to write down anti-symmetric, uh, to anti-symmetrize this um, two indices, but I have to divide by two, okay? Uh, and once I do that, then actually it becomes very clean. The, answer whole, the whole answer becomes very clean. It becomes minus f alpha beta, and then remember that the minus i j contracted with these axes is just going to be omega times partial uh, uh, is going to be, become x nu partial mu whole thing acting on this f alpha beta divided by 2. Okay? That's what's going to, that's what's going to happen. Um, and so what happens here is basically you can recognize, because it's symmetric, uh, what you can recognize is actually this guy is just this derivative of the omega. So I should pull out the omega so that it's not confusing what I mean by, by this. So it's alpha, f alpha beta times minus omega up front. So what you recognize is that with the one half, actually this is just this derivative operator acting on the Lagrangian minus one quarter ff. Right, so when you take that derivative operator and act it on the whole thing, minus one quarter will become minus one half because it's symmetric, and then the derivative operator will be acting on one of them. Okay, so that has to be the case. Why? Because it's actually exactly this guy. This guy comes from just taking the Taylor expansion of the Lagrangian, and it has to be the same because so far we have not used the equations of motion, so. So uh, it has to be the same thing. You're just Taylor expanding. That's all you're really doing, right? If you're doing uh, mathematically consistent things, you should get the same thing. Otherwise, you made a mistake. Uh, so what is different? What is different is that this part of the calculation is supposed to invoke the equations of motion, whereas this part of the calculation we're just Taylor expanding. Right. And so what we're going to do here is to, in fact, uh, keep that in mind. Right. And so what, what, what gives here? So what gives is that, remember the, the last time, mm -hmm. is that we need to remember that Maxwell's equations consist of two equations. One is divergence of f is zero. The other one is that the Bianchi uh, tells us that uh, f mu alpha beta when you antisymmetrize all the indices, is zero. And the consequence of this guy is the following. So I didn't do this very uh, in, in detail the last time, so let me do it one time so that you guys know what I'm talking about. So I, I think I skipped this one very quickly. So uh, let's do the antisymmetrization. So the trick to antisymmetrize um, uh, a bunch of indices is the following. So suppose, let's do this for the three indices. Um, mu, alpha, beta. What is this? This is actually uh, the following. The first, I'm going to free up the first in this index and then uh, anti-symmetrize the other two. Okay, and, and I do this because f menu is already anti-symmetric. So when I anti-symmetrize an already anti-symmetric uh, set of indices, I'm just going to get the number of indices factorial, in this case two. Okay? But uh, the trick here is to recognize that when you anti-symmetrize something, you need to sum over all the permutations. So mu is going to appear, and then alpha has to appear, and then beta has to appear as well. But how do you get from mu to big alpha? You swap the two. So you get a minus sign, f mu beta. 
So again, you swap mu and alpha, so you get alpha mu, but with a minus sign. And then again, you swap mu and beta, so that now beta appears here, so you get alpha mu. Okay, so that's how you permute three indices and make sure that they're all anti-symmetric. And now, you can keep going, right? You can just use the same technique, free up the first index, first index, first index. But anyway, in this case, f is anti-symmetric already. So I can write down immediately, this is zero, so I can write down immediately that twice of, twice of mu, partial mu alpha beta must be equals to twice of alpha f, partial alpha f mu beta plus partial beta f alpha mu. Okay, and but because it's twice, I can just cancel out the two uh, right away. And so what you recognize is that partial mu f alpha beta is actually minus, if I swap these two indices, becomes minus partial alpha f beta mu, and then uh, this is already partial beta f alpha, so I get the anti-symmetric uh, uh, alpha beta derivative, and then with mu at the very end. Okay, so this is equal to minus this guy, and now I can plug this in, and I get minus omega. Um, nobody stop me here, I missed an omega here. Minus omega f alpha beta x uh, mu, and then what, what I have here is actually now partial alpha f beta. Now I have to anti-symmetrize my alpha beta. And then I have a mu, which I need to anti-symmetrize. And I need a minus sign, so this becomes a plus. Okay. Again, all I'm doing is I'm using this result into this. Okay. So, so let me just break that down here. This counts from partial mu l f alpha beta is equals to partial minus partial alpha f beta and just mu. Okay. And now again I recognize that alpha beta is contracted with alpha beta. So this is anti but actually I can release the square bracket because it's uh, contracted with alpha beta anyway. So, um, uh, I forgot one half, and then that would, that would actually incur a factor of two. So that would actually give me back omega f alpha beta x mu partial alpha f beta mu. Why do I do that? Because now I can integrate by parts. So this is now alpha partial alpha f alpha beta x nu f beta mu and to symmetrize. And then of course, this is illegal, right? I gotta, I gotta cancel it out. So I gotta put minus omega, um, I'm sorry, minus here, integrate by plus, right? Minus and then plus uh, omega and then total divergence of the whole thing. F alpha beta times x nu f mu beta. Okay? So again, this guy acting on f will cancel this guy and then this guy acting on this will give you back the original expression. And now, um, uh, you use the equations of motion. So, so at this point, we've already used the equations of motion once. It's the pan key. And so at this point, we're going to use the second set of equations of motion. This will be 0. And what we'll left, be left with is that you get that um, the following. So this, the divergence of this this is also a divergence. Remember that this is actually equals to dl plus omega and then partial alpha x nu eta mu alpha l. Okay. 
Okay, and the reason why you can pull it out is because these two are uh, different indices. They are different indices so that a partial derivative doesn't act on ever interpretation. It gives you a consistent physical interpretation that um, uh, uh, you get energy momentum for translations and uh, angular momentum, meaning energy momentum cross product with x. Right? This is basically a cross product. Remember, this is this is the uh, let me write it in words. So relativistic cross product. Uh, between x alpha and uh, energy momentum. Yeah. Yeah, energy momentum is easier to interpret. I think the sure and the stress part is a little bit more tricky, right? But but you need it. Because uh, otherwise it wouldn't be coherent, right? So uh, it wouldn't be coherent otherwise. Um, so 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 um, you need the whole tensor. That's why it's a rank three tensor. Any questions for me? Uh, I have a question about yeah. the uh, mm -hmm. rotation of uh, yeah relative view yeah. of f alpha beta. Uh, I see some on. Some documents they have a uh, they put a uh, one over six factor. Yeah. So before. so right right yeah. So I don't like to get myself confused with too many symmetry factors, but yes, some books you got to be a little bit careful. So so let me write that down and then uh, so I can so everyone can understand what's happening. So you got to be a little bit careful. In this course, I have always defined my anti-symmetry to be basically just the sum over all the permutations uh, times the sign of the permutations. Right? Whatever your stuff is, alpha, beta, gap, gamma, whatever it is, just sum over all the permutations and then put in the appropriate sign. Right? Uh, in many books, uh, they prefer to put a 1 over, if suppose that n or, or d, uh, let me call it, uh, let me say uh, r, r, uh, uh, different indices, this will be R factorial, then sum over the permutations, and then times the sign, and then plus all the permutations. So you want to divide by all the indices you have factorial, uh, so that I uh, guess there's some normalization that, um, but then uh, you will quickly realize that uh, if you have more than one of these guys, at least in my opinion, uh, guess the, the, the combinatorics gets quite messy, right? So I rather, if I get confused, I rather just uh, work it out, you know, explicitly, and whatever number I get, I get, I get, right? But otherwise, you might forget that you might, you have these other symmetry factors to worry about. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, it's a choice. So be careful when you look at books um, to check the sign convention or the metric, to check, to check the convention of this uh, 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 you know, symmetry factors, the other things, you know, so every, once you get into, you know, uh, this sort of uh, uh, more advanced stuff, there are a lot of uh, uh, conventions to check whenever you, you pick up a new book. Um, that's why you often have an appendix that actually compiles all the, all the conventions they use. Um, yeah. Other questions for me? Okay, if not, we better start to quantize something. Um, okay, so uh, I am going to start with a schema field, and um, uh, you have a question for me? No? Okay. So, um, so, the key point I want to make uh, is I want to start with a free scalar field, and what I want to one of the key points I want to make is that a free scalar field can be quantized 
uh, using two different ways. One is uh, two different but two distinct but equivalent ways. Right? One is to think about it in position space, and one is to think about it in Fourier space. And in fact, they are, they are um, of course related um, because you solve the equations of motion uh, in position space by going into Fourier space. But uh, now, because we're trying to quantize them, it's good to have uh, uh, an analogy in mind. And the analogy uh, is in fact that of the simple harmonic oscillator. So um, uh, a lot of perturbative quantum field theory, in fact, comes down to uh, recognizing it as a uh, simple harmonic oscillator system. Right. So even the notion of particles, when you generate a new particle in, uh, for example, in your particle collider, what is happening is that the interaction of uh, particles excite the production of simple harmonic oscillators that correspond to other particles. So this is a homework problem that, uh, part of this actually is a homework problem that actually you've already done. Uh, where you introduce, I think you've already done, uh, you, 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 where you introduce nonlinear interactions and you see that in Fourier space, it acts like a driven harmonic oscillator. Have you guys done that problem? I think you've done the problem already. You guys remember? So if you, okay, so let's start that just to, as a reminder. So we're going to start with a free field case and then, um, and then I will remind you guys about the um, quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll give you a little quick review, and then we'll, we'll actually quantize the thing. So the free scalar field looks like the following. So it will be phi double dot minus Laplacian phi and then, uh, and then you might have a uh, potential, right? So this will be plus, for example, m squared, uh, sorry, m squared, phi squared. This is a free scalar field. If you have an interacting scalar field, then you have a minus v prime of phi on the uh, right hand side. So let's do this one first. So you can go to Fourier space. So you can go to Fourier space not space-time, but just Fourier space, then what will happen is that now you have phi tilde, still double dot, because like I said, I'm not going to uh, Fourier space-time, but Fourier space. So this will be T of K, and then this will become plus K squared, plus omega M squared, and then multiplied by phi tilde T of K equals to zero. So if I call this my energy squared, this is energy, as you remember, uh, E equals to P squared plus, E squared equals to P squared plus M squared, right? It's just that I call it K here. So in fact, what you see is that this is just like the harmonic oscillator uh, equations of motion, plus uh, E squared phi tilde equals to zero. Now, remember, what is the harmonic oscillator? It's Q double dot plus omega squared Q equals to zero. Right? This is the harmonic oscillator equation of motion. So the only difference here is that um, uh, there is a harmonic oscillator for every momentum mode. Okay, let me just write it down. There's a one harmonic oscillator for every k. And this is in fact exactly what's going to happen if you try to quantize your field uh, in uh, Fourier space. But you can also ask, right, what does it mean in position space? Okay, so so this is the Fourier, this is the Fourier picture. Uh, what about in position space? So position space is a bit more technical, so I'll just describe it in words, okay? So you can think of, 
Think about in position space, you do the following, you discretize the derivatives, the, 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 uh, yeah, you discretize the spatial derivatives. Derivatives. Okay, and then you will see, you will observe that in fact you will get the following. You will get that uh, you get a couple in position space. Phi is a con it, uh, is is really a continuum limit of an infinitely coupled set of harmonic oscillators. Okay. So because, why? Because when you discretize, those of you who might actually know more numerics than I do. If you have actually put a PDE on a computer and try to solve uh, the PDE, uh, a partial differential equation, you, you would, what, what would you do? You would have to come up with a scheme, uh, usually called finite uh, different scheme, right? To, to approximate things like um, the time derivative and the spatial derivatives. Right? So if you focus on the spatial derivatives, what you do is you take that point, over that, and you take you minus a point over here. That's the first derivative. If you have a second derivative, then usually you will at least involve three points. Right? If you want to know the uh, second derivative here, what you often end up doing is you you have to find out uh, what's the first derivative from here, what's the first derivative from here, and you try to take the difference. Right? Because the the uh, uh, second derivative is the difference of the first derivative, the change in the first derivative. I mean, so. Uh, what you realize is that when you discretize your spatial derivatives over all of space, right, the field is something that permeates all of space, then once you've written, written that down, you will recognize you can rewrite it as a matrix equation, essentially. And that matrix equation, because this equation is linear, is also linear. Okay? Except now, you have an infinite number of entries. You have an infinite number of entries because you have an infinite number of spatial points. Uh, at least if you're doing quantum field theory in, in, in infinite space. Right? Uh, this is also why, in fact, maybe I should mention this. Um, it's often also why in many textbooks you can see that they in fact quantize the uh, field in a finite box first. Because there, then you can think of it literally as a set of infinitely coupled oscillators. It turns out to be easier to regularize uh, uh, some of these quantities that you get um, uh, uh, when you are in a finite box as opposed to an infinite space. So um, what's happening is that uh, you should think of, again, in position space, you have a harmonic oscillator at every point in space but they are coupled to the neighbors, and the neighbors are coupled to the neighbors, and the neighbors are coupled to other neighbors, and so on. So it's an infinitely coupled set of harmonic oscillators. And that is why when you go to Fourier space, it decouples. Fourier space is in fact the way you decouple the oscillators by finding a different basis, the reciprocal, the, the reciprocal space basis allows you to decouple all these oscillators and uh, recognize that, in fact, each Fourier mode is itself a harmonic oscillator. Okay? Uh, so let me go on for a, a bit more. So, so, in fact, let's remind ourselves what does happen when you have a uh, simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, so what, what we will... Rec what we will um, do is going to be very, very similar. Uh, it's just that we're going to do it for all momentum. But let me, in fact, remind you what does happen in the case of um, the simple harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics.
So in quantum mechanics, we do one simple harmonic oscillator, and this Hamiltonian is given by uh, one half. So this is I'm going to set n to to one. Uh, one half uh, p squared. Uh, this is one, so in fact it's just one dimension and just one harmonic oscillator plus one half omega squared x squared. These are now operators, okay? And so what we do there is uh, we introduce these uh, raising and lowering operators, and the reason for doing that is that will allow us to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Remember that that's make the main point in, in quantum mechanics problems, right? We want to understand the Hamiltonian and basically we want to diagonalize it. So what you uh, uh, end up doing is you introduce something called A, uh, A or alpha, sometimes it's called alpha, uh, is given by um, I over two squ uh, square root of two omega, so this is meant to be a review. So uh, if you've not seen it before, it might be a little bit unfamiliar. P minus I omega x, okay? And then, uh, of course, naturally, uh, A vega would just be the adjoint of it. So you get uh, minus I over square root two omega, and then P plus I omega x. Right, assuming that P and X are both permission. So why is this important? So there are a few reasons why it's important to introduce these uh, A and A dagger. The first thing is that we can rewrite this guy in terms of uh, A and A dagger. The other one is that the commutation relations are particularly important. So let's work that out. Let's work out A and A dagger. Okay, and in fact, we'll find that this is, this is one. And let's do it. So in case people are not familiar with this, right? So this is now, uh, let's pull out uh, these guys. So you get one over two omega from the prefactors, but now you will have um, the commutator of um, P minus I omega X with P plus I omega X. So P commutes with P, so the only thing you need, uh, and X commutes with X, so the only thing you need to care about is X with P and P with X, right? So let's do the, the two. So you get one over two omega, uh, and then minus I omega, X commuted with P, and then plus uh, P commuted with X times I omega. Okay, and, and xp is i, as you guys know. Uh, so you get i minus times minus i, that's omega, over two omega. Um, and then plus um, um, this is px, so that is minus i. Minus i times i is one times omega, so this is, this is in fact one. Okay, so in the, so let me just remind you what it means. Uh, okay, actually, let me write down. So before, before we do that, so uh, H, in fact, itself, will turn out to be um, one half A dagger A. Uh, actually, it will be A dagger A plus one half. Uh, times whole thing times omega, right? So H has to be of units of energy, but it'll be A dagger A plus one half. So what is so important about these? So let me summarize that for you, and then we'll continue this discussion the next time. So what's so important about this commutation relation is that uh, it will allow you to make the following interpretation, okay? And, and I'll just uh, review it and do and do it uh, elaborate on this at the, the next time. So it will turn out that A, so there's a vacuum state. So where in the quantum mechanical context, zero is the ground state. 
in the quantum field theory context, zero will come correspond to the zero particle state. And then a dagger acting on zero will give you uh, uh, the first excited state. Up to normalization, it's not quite normalized. So, and then uh, basically you can keep going. A dagger acting n times on the on the ground state will give you the n excited state. Okay, and so uh, and in the quantum field theory context, it will turn out that these a's will depend on k. And that will give you the k particle state, okay? And so, and the, so, let me just do the harmonic oscillator quantum mechanical case first. So you find that the ground state, in fact, is one half omega, and then you can keep going. You we'll add one, you we'll add one, and so on, and it will turn out that a dagger a in the Hamiltonian over there is nothing but the number of omega. It will jump by one, by 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 one for each. Uh, each time you, you, you raise the uh, uh, ground state by a dagger, right? so you will get that the energy itself will just be uh, omega times n plus one half. And you'll see that in the uh, uh, quantum field theory case, you just replace all the, of all the uh, n's that you see will just depend on um, uh, will just be complicated by the fact that now we can have different particles for different k's. That's, that's the main complication. But otherwise, uh, you, you, you want to keep this in mind and um, uh, you will see that it's a very, very close analogy between uh, the quantum mechanical simple harmonic oscillators uh, uh, and, and the um, quantum field theory case that we're going to see in more detail the next time. Any questions for me? In precision space, yeah. uh, especially mm -hmm. we consider con continual limit, uh, so we have infinite mm -hmm. uh, simple harmonic oscillator. Yeah. Does this mean uh, we have infinite uh, infinity uh, energy in this system. Yeah, so this is a tricky problem, right? So you might be thinking about, for example, even for one harmonic oscillator, you get you don't get zero for your ground state. You get one half omega, right? And so if you have an infinite number of harmonic oscillators, then you are adding one half omega infinite number of times. Uh, even if you are in the ground state. Right? And the answer is that yes, we will find that when we quantize the scalar field and you actually work out the, the uh, 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 Hamiltonian and try to find the expectation value, you will in fact get a divergence. And this is where the divergence will come in. You will get an infinite number of omega over 2. And that will be your first encounter of a, of a divergence in, in quantum field theory. Uh, and there people just wave their hands and say, oh, let's normal order our our, our A and A daggers, and then the one half will go away. Basically, you throw it out. Basically, you know, you end up just throwing it out. And the reason, the reason for that is that in, in flat space, you don't have gravity. So, uh, at least it's the, this, the physical explanation. Right? The physical explanation is that you cannot detect absolute uh, energy scales. You can only de detect differences in energy scales. So if you're in flat space, then you don't care. But this is also what's called the cosmological constant problem in, in, uh, in, curve, in, in, in general, uh, because there is gravity, right? The real world has gravity. And so the, there is a question of what is the absolute energy scale in quantum field theory, in the sense that do these particles, uh, what do the quantum vacuum fluctuations uh, even in the ground state, what does, how much does the vacuum weigh, so to speak? Uh, because how much it weighs uh, will couple to gravity, and its effect should be like the cosmological constant. 
Uh, so there's something that people still debate about, right? It's still considered an open problem. Um, people still. So I, I don't. I personally don't. I'm not so adamant about it myself, but but people still debate it uh, regularly. Um, uh, you know, they they call it the cons cosmological constant problem. And so yes, you you're asking a, a a problem that people still think about regularly. But no, there's no, as far as you can tell, nobody has. There's no consensus on what the solution should be. Yeah, but in flat space, basically, you know. When you hear people say, oh, let's normal order the, the, the thing, basically just base, is saying, throw, throw it out. Just throw out the one half omega. Yeah. No, normal order mean uh, uh, we can yeah, now talk about we, we I'll talk about it a bit more. Basically, you, you just arrange your, you, when you normal order a operator, uh, at the level of uh, perturbation theory, just means just put all your uh, a's on the right and put all your a daggers on the left. Basically, that's what it means. So then, then you, right away, you won't have this one half. Right? That's basically what it means. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, if you work this out, we will work this out for scalars. Um, uh, by the time you start to work this out and you put a normal order, it just means that immediately you just rearrange everything. You don't care. You don't care about the fact that to commute things through, you need a one half. Uh, you need a one, right? But uh, you just do it, and then. But yeah, it's re essentially a regularization scheme. But uh, yeah, I've not seen a good physical explanation. So I think it's really just just a regularization scheme. So throw, throw it out basically at this level. Yeah. Okay. See you guys next week. It's just a more complicated version of the simple harmonic oscillator. But the, the idea is very simple. Uh, I'm sorry, very similar. So whether you're doing it in De Sitter or in uh, black hole space time or something like that, as long as it's highly symmetric, then usually you can still use the, the mode functions to, to diagonalize your hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah. So what's the means of symmetry yeah. in curved space? Yeah. Global or local? Uh, it's usually local. So there are these things called the Kerning vectors. Uh, so so uh, so the definition of symmetry in curved space is the following. Uh, if you do a if you do a if you do a small change in coordinates, so you displace you do an active displacement, but now your uh, C also depends on coordinates because you're not in curved space. So usually it doesn't make a lot of, you don't get a lot by saying, okay, let me shift by a constant. You now have to shift by something that depends on space time. Now, it turns out that uh, uh, the way to define symmetry in curved space 
is to work out what happens when you do a coding transformation like that. What happens to your metric? And it will turn out that it will, it will transform as follows. You would go like G minimum of X plus up to first order and C. It will just be a symmetric derivative 